Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. We've given people a chance. Uh, the five minutes is over when we would leave love people. I see we are more than 50, and we've also got people in our watch parties uh, that are connected uh, on behalf of the NSCW. I would like to welcome you then uh, here at our last webinar for 2023, and we are using these webinars promoting excellence in child and youth care practice. And this afternoon, we are happy that we have uh, Ms. Kim Samuel here with us, and uh, she will share with us uh, a topic is connecting better lessons from South Africa and understanding belonging as a theory of change. Uh, I've got someone, uh, Francisco will officially introduce our guest speaker. I, my task is just to say welcome to uh, members of the NECCW, our national executive, our directors, and all child and youth care workers. We're happy that you have participated so well over the year and uh, found our Webinar is very interesting, and uh, we're also looking forward uh, to the, the information that Kim will share with us this afternoon. Uh, my task is also just to remind everybody, as we are in this webinar, that you need to mute uh, your microphone, as well as not switch on your cameras as it influence, uh, you know, the transfer of information in the sound and all the technical information. We would like to ask you as we go along this afternoon, please uh, just share with us that you are there in your watch parties. We also want to welcome those child and youth care workers that have come together and watch uh, at uh, the institutions or maybe somewhere where they are connecting and we would like you to share there on the chat box uh, that you are together with us and any comments or questions, <clears throat> excuse me, you can post there in the chat box as we will deal with your questions and concerns after Kim has delivered uh, lessons learned from South Africa with us and we're looking forward to your participation and we will allow you to ask as many questions and we will also would like to respond. Please share with us your number for the council as we also like to register webinars to receive our continuous development points uh, for our as part of our development year. So Welcome once again, a heart and warm welcome. And I'd like to hand over then to Francisco uh, to do the official introduction of our guest speaker. Francisco, over to you. I, I think that Francisco is just struggling uh, to, to get in, Elwin. And while we're waiting for him, maybe if I could just actually just, just orientate others. We have others from the child and youth care a uh, sector in South Africa who have joined, especially today, because uh, I think Kim has joined us. So we are very excited to have people from Synagos and people from the child protection section uh, uh, in 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 South Africa. And just to say that 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 we have started this year the NACCW webinars promoting excellence in child and youth care practice. And for our our first speaker, we had Dr. Heather Modlin from CYC Net, who. Who, is, uh, who spoke on Wired for Connection, keeping the love in child and youth care practice. We were followed by Mr. Jack Phelan, who spoke on the use of self in child and youth care practice. We were followed by Mr. James Friedman, who spoke upon leading with kindness in child and youth care work. Professor Jim Anglin spoke about trauma, pain and healing in child and youth care work. And Professor Mark Smith spoke about the best years of our lives, reflections on the roots of child, uh, the roots on the and the essence of child and youth care work. We had Mr. Jack Phelan again, 
who talked to us about activity matters and showed us how to engage with activities uh, that that are that important. And so now today for our last uh, webinar for the, the year, we are very excited to have Kim Samuels in here and Francisco will do the official introduction. Over to you, Francisco. Good afternoon. I'm not sure why I can't get my video on. Um, let me just try one more time. Can you, is it, am I visible? No. No. Okay, fine. May I continue without the video? That's fine, Francisco, Thank thanks. Yes. Thank you very much. The title of this afternoon's session is Connecting Better, Lessons from South Africa and Understanding Belonging as a Theory of Change. And the short summary to this is, in this speech, the author, the educator and activist Kim Samuel will reflect on South Africa's connections to the belonging movement, as well as lessons learned during her visit to Cape Town, Durban and Johannesburg recently. Kim will outline her theory of change, which uh, posits that by simple virtue of the fact that we are born, we all possess an inherent and inalienable birthright a right to belong, in other words. And finally, building up, building on her four piece framework for belonging, Kim will offer belonging focused solutions tailored to supporting children and youth during this unprecedented era of disconnect and isolation. So who is Kim? Kim Samuel is an activist, an educator, a scholar, and a leading voice in the global movement for belonging she is the founder and chief belonging officer of the Samuel Center for Social Connectedness. I think and do thank tank that partners with leading advocacy groups in research organizations to combat social isolation and build belonging around the world. Kim is currently a visiting research fellow at Green Templeton College, University of Oxford, and a visiting scholar at the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative. She presently serves on the steering committee of the Together Coalition, the Executive Committee and Board of Special Olympics International, and the Disability Rights Advisory Committee of Human Rights Watch. Kim is the author of On Belonging, Finding Connection in an Age of Isolation, an exploration of the crisis of social isolation and, and our birthright of belonging, which was published by Abrams Press in, to, in 2022. Please join me in welcoming Kim Samuel as our keynote speaker. Over to you, Kim. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you to everyone uh, for inviting me to, to be here today and uh, especially to my dear friend Zenny, to Alwyn and to Francisco and all of you at NACCW for this kind invitation to be with you today. And I will share what I know, but I want to uh, begin by sharing that a lot of what I've learned has, uh, has come from time spent in South Africa. And I'd like to begin that way. The uh, National Association of Child Care Workers is no stranger to me. And in fact, we go back more than a decade together. Since 2012, the NACCW has been a strong partner and thought leader in the global belonging movement. Yours was one of the first organizations to not only understand the importance of social connectedness, but also incorporate elements directly into your programming. Over the years, I've worked with NACCW leaders and members to share lessons on how we can best support development of children and youth, and also to support one another. And one day in particular stands out when the NACCW was pivotal, pivotal pardon me, to advancing our cause. And uh, Zenny will remember this well. It was in 2013 and I was in Grabo alongside partners from the Synergos Institute and the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative. We were visiting with NACCW colleagues when I spotted on the wall a medicine wheel. 
and I was told that it was being used as a community healing tool. Instantly, I recalled the medicine wheels often used by Indigenous communities throughout my home country of Canada. Here we were over 13,000 kilometers apart, and there was commonality in how NACCW and Canadian Indigenous communities heal those who need help. And I realized in that moment that despite the geographical, linguistic and cultural differences, there was a shared foundational approach to healthcare, one rooted in tradition. So my mind next went to, how do we get everyone in the same room to share wisdom and best practices? How do we connect the people who are already building belonging at a grassroots level, people who might not otherwise meet? I returned home from South Africa and got to work planning and then hosting the first ever Social Connectedness Global Symposium. It was here that partners from NACCW, Indigenous leaders across Canada, and people from a wide range of international organizations and practice areas came together in the same place to learn from one another and lay the groundwork of a co-created global movement. The legendary music producer, Quincy Jones, once told me that coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. And let me tell you, seeing that medicine wheel in Grabo felt like divine intervention to me. Belonging has deep roots in South Africa, punctuated by key moments that have shaped the vision of what this movement can and should be. That day in 2013, a whole decade ago, was a big moment. Another big one happened in 2002. I was at a dinner in New York City with Nelson Mandela and Gratia Michelle. My father had recently passed away following a brain injury and Gratia asked me how I had been doing in the aftermath. I admitted that I was struggling and that I miss my dad every day. I also told them both about the isolation that my father had experienced in his final years, not because he had disabilities, but because of how other people treated him due to his disabilities. Of course, I said, turning to Nelson Mandela, you would know all about isolation. And he paused for a moment, then replied with careful thought and intention, no, I have never been isolated. No, he said quietly. On Robben Island, we were all brothers working together with a common purpose. I was never alone. I was never alone, he said. What an extraordinary statement. That conversation with Gratia Marshall and Nelson Mandela was pivotal in shaping my understanding of what isolation is and isn't. More to come on this later. But we shouldn't be surprised that the belonging movement can trace roots back to South Africa. The vision of Ubuntu is inherently about belonging. I am what I am because of who we all are. To me, Ubuntu is about common care and the strength and spirit of community. And during the transition from apartheid, South Africa became a global leader in the dialogue around belonging and equality. It's been more than 25 years since Mandela signed the South African constitution into law, as you know, and it remains one of the most progressive constitutions in the world. It includes the right to human dignity, the right to a healthy environment, and rights to food, water, health care, and social assistance. However, as we all know, just because something is written down does not mean it is practiced. I saw evidence of this firsthand during my recent visits to Johannesburg, Durban, and Cape Town. The summer I was in South Africa, this summer, pardon me, to talk about my new book, meet with program partners and advance the dialogue around social connection and belonging. In Johannesburg, I hosted an event with three of South Africa's most inspiring activists. Gresham Marshall, whom I mentioned already, is a fierce advocate of women's and children's rights. Josina Marshall, a gender-based violence survivor, advocate, 
and founder of the Kuluka movement on gem gender based violence, and Amange Sin Soto, a powerhouse youth activist. This intergenerational discussion highlighted the importance of women's empowerment to achieving belonging for all. Indeed, we are powerful and we are strong when we stand up together and when we uphold the rights of the people around us. I said for a long time that we only belong if we belong together. That's never been truer than it is today. During my trip, I also spoke at the Lifeline Durban Annual General Meeting. As you may know, Lifeline volunteers counsel those who are having suicide ideation, those experiencing gender-based violence, people living in extreme poverty, and so much more. Their goal is mental and emotional health for all. When I address their membership, I stress that we must care for our caregivers. What that means is that the people for whom caring is a calling, people who spend their days helping others, deserve our utmost attention and wholehearted support. People like you, who work with children and youth, do incredible selfless work every day. But it's precisely because you are caregivers that you are at a higher risk of burnout. It's because you care. I shared the thinking in Durban and I am echoing the same thinking again now. Your mental health, your physical health, and your overall well being should be a top priority because you cannot fill the cup of others when your own cup is empty. And finally, in Cape Town, I sat on a panel where the topic was the rights of older people. We talked about alienation and isolation facing people as they age in South Africa. And I heard from panelists directly that there exists a limited and crumbling system of care for older people. From inadequate state pensions to severe lack of funding for community programming, I heard stories from many who are bravely saying, we're living in poverty, we're lonely and isolated. This is not good enough. We demand better. This discussion also demonstrated the power of hearing from affected people directly, in this case, older people themselves. They were the true activists there that day and those with life experience that they could use in order to inform further action and shape solutions. These are just a few of the intersectional challenges facing South Africa today. As you know, there are many more, including one that's been making the rounds in the media lately. A new report by the Growth Lab at Harvard University examined why South Africa's economy has failed to grow at a rate similar to its peers. The findings detailed a collapse in state capability with the report calling out political patronage and the resulting inability to attract and retain talented public servants, as well as ideological gridlock in government that presents critical decisions from getting made. Could I just interrupt for a second? Could I ask if anyone other than me maybe could mute right now? Because I think there's a few voices in there. I've done a bit of a Anyway, I'll carry on. <laughs> um, it also speaks to Zaleka, the you're not muted. Zaleka, can you please mute? Thanks, Sunny. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. It also speaks to the negative impacts of spatial exclusion, a byproduct of apartheid era zoning that has been difficult to reverse in practice. The result is regional inequality of job opportunities worsened by density restrictions, transport costs, and significant gaps in transportation networks. Ultimately, the report finds that South Africa is not accomplishing its goals of inclusion, empowerment, and transformation, and South Africa's enormous potential in its people, land, assets, and capabilities are left underutilized. This is an important new study 
which uh, came out last week, uh, by the way, that should serve as a blunt reminder to the ANC that economic growth and social inclusion go hand in hand, and they cannot be ignored any longer. But of course, there are other issues we must address. For example, we know that gender-based violence, GBV, has been and continues to be a massive challenge, with President Ramfosa even likening it to a pandemic. Climate change has driven migrants and refugees inward, away from the coasts and into densely populated areas where they are forced to compete with locals for limited jobs, housing and resources. The country suffers from not enough mental health professionals. Two, unemployment is high, as in inequality. And load shedding, as I've been experiencing uh, energy blackouts, which started many years ago out of necessity, have become commonplace. Now, it is essential here to note that tough challenges are not exclusive to South Africa. When we expand the lens outward, we see that there are countless complex crises affecting the whole world. Despite being more technologically connected than ever before, loneliness is widespread and growing in severity. The United States Surgeon General just this summer declared loneliness as a public health emergency. The rise of artificial intelligence risks doing to white collar jobs what automation did to blue collar jobs. Citizens trust in their governments and institutions is plummeting. Toxic political polarization has seemingly become the new norm and tragic interstate conflict dominates the news cycle. Suffice it to say, we are in a very difficult and precarious moment in time. There are many things that need our urgent attention, and as global citizens, it's easy to feel overwhelmed by the constant competition for our outrage. But despite how different all of these issues might appear on the surface, when we dig a little deeper, we can see that all of them have a common element, belonging or rather the lack of belonging, can be linked to each of those issues as either an underlying cause or a devastating effect. The remedy then must include a concerted and sustained effort to build a world in which we all belong. Which brings me now to my theory of change. I approach most of today's ill from the perspective of building belonging. This is my ethos, the underlying framework that helps me evaluate issues and offer solutions that are human centered and rooted in collaboration. So with this in mind, let's start with the basics. What is belonging? Well, to me, belonging means being at home wherever you are. Belonging is holistic, deeply felt and personal. For example, a person might experience belonging in a room with other people, while someone else might feel like they belong living alone in a cabin in the woods. My belonging will be different from your belonging, and that's to be expected. However, after decades of studying this topic, I found that our personal sense of belonging can often be boiled down to our connection to four core dimensions which all happen to start with the letter P. People, place, power, and purpose, the four Ps. Let me briefly expand on these. First, people. When we belong, we have connection to our community and those around us, and we form relationships rooted in reciprocity. In practice, that might mean checking in regularly on an older family member, joining a book club or becoming a regular at the local weekend market. Next is place. When we belong, we feel at home in the spaces we inhabit, both in terms of our fixed neighborhoods, our natural environment, and our temporary spaces, like a workplace setting. In practice, connection to place might mean exploring the forest on the other side of town, 
learning more about the history of your region or insisting that where you work incorporates the principles of universal design where all are welcome. Third is power. When we belong, we have agency and influence over the systems that govern us. We've seen a lot of disconnection from power in South Africa lately. Look no further than the service delivery protests of recent years, where locals in many communities are speaking up over lack of basic essentials like water, sanitation, and housing. These movements are ultimately about reclaiming power and building belonging for ourselves and each other. And finally, purpose. When we belong, we believe in something bigger than ourselves. It's helpful to think of this as our own personal sense of why. To connect to our purpose, we might consider mentoring an up and comer <laughs> in, uh, in our community, in a school. If we're a teacher or a senior student, we can mentor. Volunteering at the infant ward of a hospital or anywhere where there are children in need or searching for enlightenment through faith. faith. I imagine that many of you might find purpose through the work you do every day to help South Africans' children. I bet you see them all as your own. People, place, power, and purpose. Those are the four types of connection that we as human beings yearn for. These are the dimensions that, if fulfilled, will deliver us a true experience of belonging. But I would argue that we should not stop there in our aspirations. We must think beyond connection to the four Ps. Because belonging isn't just a nice thing to have or a distant utopia to strive toward, but rather it's a real and essential birthright that must be protected and upheld for every person, regardless of our circumstances. This is why I believe that each and every one of us possesses an inherent right to belong. So belonging, the four Ps and the right to belong. This is my framework, my humble theory of change that I abide by, co-created with and informed by countless individuals and groups. And it is through this lens that I would like to highlight examples that offer ideas for how we can build belonging specifically for children and youth. With a loneliness crisis gripping communities across the globe, today's young people are struggling. I'm sure you hear this and see this in your work every day. So how do we help youth and children connect with others? How do we bolster that essential connection between people? Here are a few ideas. We know that technology and social media have become powerful and often negative forces in our daily lives. That's why we must encourage children and youth to push away from their screens and connect with family and friends in person. Face-to-face -face interaction is key to bolstering our sense of belonging. We know for a fact that child development is greatly helped when meaningful bonds with others are formed. And here, intergenerational bonds are something really special. Take inspiration from homegrown programs like the Atenduini Family Care Center's Granny Program. Here, volunteer grannies are matched with children who have been abused, neglected, abandoned, or orphaned. They spend quality time together, up to two hours a day, five days a week, laughing playing games, and connecting. The results of this program speak for themselves. Evidence from program evaluation shows that this practice helps the children build meaningful social connections. It also helps them develop self-confidence and self-esteem. The late Patience Mugadi, one of the Go-Go's I interviewed for my book, told me that in the beginning, the children are often withdrawn, describing them as sad, blank, and unemotional. But through the program, they open up significantly and become trusting, 
especially following steady interaction with their go-go. This is consistent with prominent research about dynamics between youth and a grandparent or grandparent type figure. The Social Science and Medicine Journal tells us that children who have close relationships with their grandparents show better social skills and higher levels of empathy. And the Journal of Family Psychology reports fewer emotional and behavioral problems. So, as we work to help young people find their belonging, let's remember that in-person bonding is crucial and relationship with a grandparent figure can be hugely beneficial to development. Next, how do we help children and youth connect to place? Well, getting children outside in our natural world to explore, to learn, and to play is one strategy that has a big impact in a small price tag. In addition to countless health benefits like improved sleep and reduced stress and anxiety, encouraging kids to spend time in nature can help them feel connected to their communities. It also treat, teaches children about the notion of, res of responsible dependence which is the idea that I depend on the environment and the environment depends on me. And because of that, I will do my best to preserve and take care of it. When it comes to belonging for children and youth through connection to power, I think of a great local example that I know many of you will be familiar with, and that's City Year. This program trains young people to become service leaders in their community. Those enrolled in the program serve in leadership positions and exercise agency by giving back to other local young people and children. Programming includes after school sports, mentorship, homework help, and building community housing and schools together. Not only are these city or service leader workers gaining valuable leadership skills and learning about autonomy and authority, they're also helping to ensure the success of their younger peers when it comes to academics, volunteering, and community building initiatives. This is an excellent way to encourage young people to connect to power and ultimately build belonging for themselves and others. And finally, let's talk about purpose. This is a big one for many young people, especially those who are vulnerable and lacking a traditional support network. How do we help children and youth find purpose and meaning in their lives? Here, I think of your organization in particular, NACCW, as a wonderful example. Your colleague, Zenny, once shared with me the story of Akona. After getting pregnant at age 15 and with a fractured education system at the start of the COVID pandemic, Akona dropped out of school but she knew that she wanted to continue her studies. She was supported and mentored in the safe space of an NACCW after school program, which provided a place where she could be around other young women and share her fears and dreams for the future. Children and youth care workers like Namvulu Piri worked alongside Akona, listening with compassion and providing kindness and guidance in planning next steps. And ultimately, and with the help of NACCW, Akona made the choice to re-enter her education and complete her studies while raising her newborn son. I was so pleased to learn from Zenny that Akona is now in her first year of university pursuing a degree in agriculture. This, my friends, is belonging at work. By encouraging Akona to connect to purpose, she is now able to raise her child and pursue the advanced education she always wanted, which will provide many opportunities for her son and her family in the years to come. It's in this way we build belonging. It's in this way that we support vulnerable youth and give them something to aspire to, reminding them that anything is possible. So three cheers for everyone at NACCW. I want to close by keeping my focus squarely on this organization and the amazing things 
that you all do every day. Your ethos and your incorporation of social connection into how you operate is truly inspiring, inspires me every day. In the pages of my book, I talk about how the circle is an important symbol in the belonging movement. When sharing a meal or a conversation, we often sit in a circle format to facilitate connection and signify equality among parties. In my past global symposia that I've hosted in Canada in partnership with many others, we both opened and closed the gatherings with Indigenous drumming, where participants are arranged in a circle, gathered as equals and in connection, in relationship to one another. And in my book on belonging, I make the case that belonging is really about creating ever expanding circles of reciprocal care. The circle is also an important symbol as we conceptualize the sharing of gifts and how it relates to building belonging. The poet and essayist Lewis Hyde said that a gift must always move. In his view, a gift that stays with the receiver loses its gift properties, but a gift that is passed along remains abundant. He says, the best form of gift exchange is one that moves in a circle, passing from person to person, expanding the circle of reciprocity outward. I feel this as evident in the work NACCW does. And we know that in a circle, often an object is placed around uh, in each person's hand and then into the next and the next and the next. And my favorite symbol for that is, uh, is the Firestone, which I first learned about here. I think also of the Isibindi Safe Parks program, which as you know, provides children with spaces of comfort and connection, allowing for small group interaction with care workers. Safe parks with locations all across Canada is, pardon me, all across South Africa is an after school and weekend program dedicated to recreation and learning, a place where children can play sports, do activities, garden, sing, dance, and receive a meal. Tens of thousands of children have already received love and guidance through a safe park program. It's here that children very often feel comfortable enough to share their innermost concerns and worries. What an amazing gift that is. But the gift doesn't end there. The children's concerns are brought up during community dialogues where care workers can pass on what they've heard directly and strategize next steps with the community. And from there, issues are often elevated to childcare forums which have civil society leaders present and where real decisions get made. All of this stems from that initial interaction in that safe space where kids can be themselves, have a voice and share what they are feeling. From the kids to the child care workers, to the community, to the decision makers, this is rounding the circle and passing the gift forward, refusing to let it stop after the first level of care. We see the idea of reciprocity in a circular system of care in many indigenous traditions, which is another thing that NACCW does really well. By incorporating indigenous teacher teachings and worldviews, NACCW creates programming that is holistic and rooted in deep respect. You understand that well being is about the physical, the mental, the spiritual, the emotional. It is bigger than one single thing, which helps provide support for children and youth, and frankly, all of us, that is well rounded and allows for healing of the whole person. And I really believe that NACCW is powerful and effective because of your willingness 
to meet children and youth where they are. Treat them with respect, no matter their life circumstances, and create programming solutions that incorporate local, cultural, and traditional practices. And on top of that, you succeed in two seemingly separate but fundamentally interconnected worlds, supporting both the children and youth that need your help and offering training and resources for the professionals who work in this space. NACCW is practicing empathy daily by caring for the caregiver, as I call it, so that you can give all to the children you work with. The circle rounds and the gift keeps moving. Friends and colleagues, I hope my remarks today have helped to give a bit of an overview of how we can take belonging forward in our work, in our lives. So much of what you do is already building belonging and replacing social isolation with real connection. So keep up the incredible work. And as a parent, and a grandparent and a human being myself, thank you for caring for the young people of South Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Kim. Uh, you have in a simplistic manner shared with us the concept of belonging. And I think uh, as you explain in the end, what we are doing at times, we forget that we are in our profession and in the NECW promoting this important aspect of belonging. We would like then uh, to open the floor uh, to see if there are any questions for clarity and uh, any comments people would like to make. Uh, if you could just raise your uh, hand and then we will acknowledge you. I'm just gonna ask Zeni then in the meantime, as I cannot uh, open my chat box, just to check if there's not any other comments in the chat box, Zeni. Yes, uh, Chairperson, the, someone's made a comment that belonging makes everyone have a sense of living and help them care for each other. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. People have said that here in the chat box, they've enjoyed the discussion. They're saying that what they're picking up from the from the presentation is that we're giving children a chance to map their environments. As we are about to go now into the Christmas holidays, it also gives child and youth care workers a chance to observe how the child's sense of belonging is. Is he going to be safe in his community or his home or a community with his peers and so on? By that mapping, the child care worker will plan a holiday program. And that comes from Zodidi, a child and youth care worker from, from KZN. Someone else says belonging makes everybody feel uh, safe. I think that that point, I think that when also uh, when when you were talking about about the issue of space and safe space that 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 uh, mm -hmm. children do need. Thank you very much, Caswell, for that. Are there anybody else with questions before I go on? Um, uh, Jabu and uh, um, Sibo. Others who are wanting to make a comment, now might be the right time. Francisco, would you like to raise your question? You've put it in the chat box, but it might require you to explain it. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks for that. I, I was saying that uh, an hour ago before the meeting, I sat in a meeting uh, where the decision had to be made uh, about the future of a 16-year-old child who isn't happy in the children's home right now. Uh, she displays lots of anger. And my question was, um, if we should consider moving this child to a stricter environment, what would be the benefits for the child? Because she was she was placed in foster care at the age of two, then in a place of safety, then in a children's home that closed down, and now she's with us. And, and, and the real question is, where is a sense of belonging? We've been trying to find family members, but this is very hard. And are there family members in the com or families in the community who would be able to provide the sense of belonging? So it's really navigating, you know, your thoughts around those kind of things, which which is real in our in our children's homes right now. 
Oh, thank you, Francisco. Did you uh, in just before I respond, I just wanted to clarify one thing. Did you were you asking if the this child should should be perhaps in a stricter environment? That was the question that was that you, posed to me. OK, 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 right. So well, that's, that's what and, I meant. And so okay. that was my response. You know, I said, so what would be the benefits for if it, if the child were to be moved into a more stricter environment? Yeah, um, I want to to be clear that I'm uh, if I could go back to school again, I would become a social worker, uh, but I haven't I haven't done that yet. So I'm going to just give you um, I can't really I can't really speak in that capacity, but I guess as in the belonging capacity, it, it's it's just really important to to remember that this isn't a one. There's no one, and I know you know this, Francesco. I'm just responding overall to the question. There's not a one-time solution or a one-part solution, and very sadly. Uh, I think we can we can't create belonging for anybody else. We can't. Starting with me, we can't. I can't. But what we can all do, and we all have the capacity to do, is to create the conditions that can bring about somebody finding their belonging. And those conditions uh, would include safety and trust and not being judged or blamed. And for a young person uh, that is that has been sound like bounced around all over the place and maybe not even ever known what I consider the fundamental principle of belonging is feeling at home wherever we are. To not have that feeling at all is uh, is is true isolation to me and if you don't have that feeling and that reciprocity and relationships with others then it's pretty hard to get out of it alone so when i think about i was thinking i'd like to give you to quote someone else here um mrs uh eunice kennedy shriver she, she's no longer with us but her spirit is and she founded the special olympics and uh, which some of you may may know of, but it's a worldwide program based on sports for uh, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And more and more, they're typically able teammates. And she once um, said to me, but she said it, she said it to many people, too. She said about family, there is nothing more important than family. So if you don't like the one you have, go get yourself another one. And I think what she was saying and what I took out of that is how much we all need a family, whether it's one that we're born into or we get to create or or for this this young person is really something that everyone around has to come and nurture and and, and it won't even necessarily be the house or where where they're living in um, the it takes a village. But this idea of a stricter environment, to me, uh, the notion of that just doesn't sit right because I think what's stricter than being in a, in a, uh, not having a sense of home is you're moving toward, you work to some kind of institution. I'm not at all for that. So maybe the, you know, the word is how to bring in a lot of what maybe uh, maybe you're already volunteering to help this family. Maybe it's part of your work, but to bring in what NACCW stands for, which is about love and compassion and uh, and belonging. And hopefully, hopefully one day for this young person, the walls might come down. Yeah, because it's not about the 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 staff working with a child with a child. Otherwise, they'd be satisfying their own needs. It's it's actually just focusing on the needs well, of the child. I think it's it's everyone. I I think it's I think it's all about all of us learning more and more. Um, I learn. I hope I live a really really long life because I'm learning new things every day that I can hopefully apply. But yeah, it's not. 
um, I always want those. I was inspired by my mom, actually, the way she took care of my my father uh, in what turned out to be the last years of her of his life. And uh, and she she needed I got aware she she did everything for my dad, but she needed support and care, too. And that's where I came up with in person uh, in my family, what caregiving to the caregiver is. But I'm also I'm also trying to say that we can all be caregivers. And that that child, every child to me is a child of God. And that child at 16 is can be a difficult age anyway. Um, there may be all kinds of different, different, um, different things and inputs and helping and, and hopefully one will work, but it's that repeating again and again and again. Um, but the strict, the strictness, I kind of, I'd like to replace that with a more nurturing and loving environment. Um, uh, with as many people in it as possible and maybe maybe there's someone whoever it is that connects with that that young person but it could take a long time I think that's also hard isn't it everybody the patience that is required um, in uh, in doing this work too anyway thank you for that for your question thank you thank you I uh, saw the uh, Jabu's hand is up uh, Jabu you may pose your question uh, it's actually not a question, but a comment, Che. Uh, right. Yeah, you know, when I had you Kim sharing the story about Akona, you know, how she, she actually belonged, I just, what came to my mind was a particular program that we have, which is called the Child Protection Network Meeting, where different uh, stakeholders or professionals come together with an aim of this one voice, you know, of helping this particular child, you know, with an aim of looking looking at the best interest of this child, where we all become accountable. We all belong in this particular yeah. group. And you know, you know that you are just a call away from the next person because it, it just starts with you belonging. So with us belonging in this group, we are able to extend a hand, we are able to receive a service, we are able to even receive a layering uh, you know, of, of services for, for, for children to actually benefit. So it's mostly, you know, one powerful uh, thing when we speak about belonging. And I'm also thinking of, you know, one of the most uh, innovative uh, program or activity we came up with as NSCW, you know, the mapping, you know, where children mm -hmm. belong in this particular mapping. They come into this group you know, maybe one is not even doing well academically, but when they start belonging and seeing other children passionate about, you know, drawing, seeing other children sharing their voices through drawing, and we are able to see mm -hmm. Wanda's children excelling even academically. So, you know, belonging is, is it's something very powerful. Thank you. Thanks, to, thank you, um, Jabu. And I just wanted to add, uh, I guess maybe a, a request of my own, which is when you talk about uh, the mapping and in, in, in the context of the child uh, protection network group uh, and in other places is uh, NACCW doing this, is that mapping is really important to me too as a concept for mapping. How can we map someone's where they are in, in their belonging? and. And so if anyone, uh, if you, um, Jabu or other have any ideas for me uh, to share, I'd appreciate it. And one of the, the reasons why, in addition to all the reasons that you've given and what mapping facilitates, it's that I think about if we want to understand anything, for example, if we want to understand someone's experience of poverty, then ask them and they'll tell you. And and when we talk about and then when we talk about um, social prescribing, you know, that's I love the concept of social prescribing, but it's equally important that that individual who is receiving a social prescription is directly involved with how that manifests. So it's really about keeping the the person, whether it's it's mapping for an individual or maybe there's a way to map and see uh, see among uh, among a group is that it keeps that focus right where we want it and not coming up with with metrics, which it's so easily done coming up with metrics that don't actually fit the situation. So I love what you're doing with mapping. Thank you. 
chairperson, can I just come in quickly to say that yes. there was a, a there was a there was there's a lovely uh, lucky should speak to this. He puts a, a, a puts in the chat box that belonging creates a sense of positive protection as children can express their feelings and feel safe. Now and he talks from Kimberley, uh, Kim, uh, 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 and and Kimberley they haven't had water for days now. I'm talking about the whole of Kimberley. And children are going to school and writing exams and coming back. We've closed our safe park because we can't have children come there. There's no water for the toilets, no water for them to drink. And maybe they should they should express it themselves. We've actually literally closed our office. But children are looking up uh, at family me members and adults to provide and to make a plan to get water, which creates a sense of safety and belonging. And I'm getting a sense that somehow or the other, when you talk about mapping belonging, that in disaster times or in crisis, you know, communities, family, uh, children, uh, you know, come together to look after each other. It's an interesting story of exactly what you asked for. You know, that yeah, is a but absolutely. That's a, yeah, I'd love yeah. to, Sunny. When if there's a way that I could, if it's allowed, that I could see afterward, or someone could save what's in the chat room. Um, I, I mean, I'd love to. I'm taking notes as I can, but if it was, if it were possible to see, to see these, that would be great. Yes, including yes. positive protection. Yeah, yes, certainly. We'll send you the the whole clip. We 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 normally save it, and 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 because people who can't make the meeting or the webinar also wants to re-listen to it. So oh. people are uh, there'll be more people at the moment just to say that they are yeah. uh, uh, there more than I think we think 140 people on this webinar. Yeah. Many of them are in 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 uh, groups watch watch parties. Yeah. So uh, there's well, there's a lot of you. a lot of interest. Uh, there's a hand up chair. Uh, yes, I saw the hand of Donald and Caswell. Uh, Donald, maybe you should come and then after that Caswell and then Kim can respond to the two questions. OK. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I okay. wanted to. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Kim, okay. for this presentation. I also wanted to inf to we speak on the concept of Ubuntu that uh, I think that we've got a foundation uh, in South Africa and Africa because of there is a very strong sense of family. And when we talk, when we are talking of, you know, being alone, um, it still can be avoided. Um, be, and our role as child and youth care workers is to continue encouraging um, communities and family members to um, to embrace children who are experiencing uh, difficulties, who uh, may be offended, who may be um, abused, or having or struggling with their behavior, and that will ensure that we do not find ourselves um, in in a state that other countries now, as you indicated, Kim, where they are looking at uh, at uh, loneliness as a big issue. Mm -hmm. And yeah, whereas in 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 our case, there is that togetherness, there is a, a sense of family and a sense of caring for one another. So mm -hmm. we can continue encouraging and building on 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 that. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for that, uh, Donald. And uh, I really ag agree with you about about family and the the importance of this. But also, not everyone not everyone gets that family uh, experience. So I think we all have to be there to be part of to make. I live in a country. I live in mostly in the UK now, which is my country's Canada. Um, so I I don't have family there. So. I've made a family and none of us are related to each other, but it's people that I can count on. And I, I think that's one of the things that that we can all do is to help is to help uh, people that are in really hard circumstances and and lo loneliness probably wouldn't be the word that they'd identify. But um, when I think also of social isolation, I think of how. Uh, groups groups of people can be isolated even having uh having that sense that strong sense of family if they don't have uh any um any voices 
being heard in terms of the policies, the governance, the governance, uh, the governments uh, that uh, that are deciding uh, deciding what's priority and so on. So while I know what you're saying about this internet uh, global crisis and loneliness, I think I think part of it is that people because it's so much in the media that there's not really stigma attached now to being lonely, as um, which is really good. But there's so many other things that go in for me to isolation and to lack of lack of belonging that uh, the lessons that you that you just shared, Donald, and the learning, I think, are ones that probably everywhere in the world um, represent the, the kind of world that we all wish that we were living in where we can count on each other and we don't judge each other and where we're, we can't make someone else belong, but we can all actively help to to create those conditions. And somewhere along the line, I think that helps our own belonging too. Caswell, uh, you may then also pose your question. Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon, Chair, and good afternoon, Tim, and good afternoon, good afternoon. To, to everyone as well. Thank you. Um, belonging it also help to connect with children for the purpose. Uh, I want to share a bit of uh, life space work of what we have done this morning. Yes. There is this child whom. Uh, struggled, his eyes cannot see clearly. He can't see from afar. So what we have done uh, to assist those, uh, that child in that particular school, we assisted the SBST to uh, school-based support team to complete what we call an assessment. One, two, and three, up until it go to the district level. So this child around August, he felt no need for him to come to school. And then the child youth care about what we'll do every morning when it comes in uh, during our gate supervision, because children will feel like they belong to that particular environment when someone recognizes them in the morning. And that's how she connected with that child. So she will get him in the morning. I'll come and see you during breaks. It continued and continued. The process went up until uh, the department realizes that I think we need to support the child because when the child write exam, they will provide him with uh, they call them blue cardboard, where he can able to see the the words that are very big. So normally, when he write uh, test or exam, it will take around four hours to finish, while others have long gone. So this child, uh, now we were preparing for exam in October. Said no, I'm not going to go into the class. I don't want to do anything. So. What we have done was okay, the child youth care worker will be with you in a small office, though there are some staff who are there. They're going to assist you with their work on a daily basis. So one day the child and youth care worker um, did what we call it's a, it's a cutting and pasting, just to show the child that, you know what, in life we need to be very impatient. We need to be very patient so that we can able to get what we want. So the child realizes that the child and youth care worker is not losing patience, that like others as well. Let me tell you this, because we were connecting with the child for the purpose for him to realize that for him to continue studying, that will help him improve his life. If maybe his own children will have the same so that they can practice this type of, uh, of, of patience. Let me tell you this morning uh, when the psychologist arrived at the school, we were so very impressed, very impressed in a way that they did an assessment now. The child has been recommended that next day, January, he will be transferred to the life skills center of his choice, where the department will, will, will support him as well. So I like to support, I think this falls under your four piece of belonging that we have mentioned earlier on, that we connect with children for the peoples. I realized that our peoples here was to make the child understand that uh, uh, academics or learning or studying will improve his life as well, or also the life of the families as well. That's what I want to share as well. Lastly, uh, I've missed the three piece. I can't remember uh, what were you, uh, what uh, exactly do they mean? If you could refresh me on that as well. Thank you. Okay, there. Uh, thank you for all that you added. And the four P's are people, place, power, purpose, people, connection to one another, the, the relationships that we have, 
to place the places that we call home or the places that we can't call home. Uh, where we uh, have that sense of the being maybe being part of the roots of a tree. It's very hard today because we tend to move around a lot. It can be our workspaces. It can be. Uh, it can be places that we look at the way we feel sometimes in a city is different than the way we feel in the country and so on. But connection to place and that really relates for me very strongly to environment and what happens when uh, Kimberly doesn't have enough water. What happens to people's sense of place? Uh, to power is um, our power within ourselves and our ability to to be a voice, which we all are uh, with that capability in the in the systems that govern us. And I also really, uh, really imagine the connection to power is really about our role. All of us to be able to empower others through whatever gifts we've received. And in terms of purpose, uh, it's that sense of something bigger than oneself. Uh, I would imagine that I don't have much to explain to any of you uh, about uh, any of these four P's, but in particular, the uh, the sense of purpose. It's that sense of why and what do we want to do in the world? And that's uh, that's the four P's. Uh, thank you, Kim. I see Mo also have raised the hand. Uh, Mo, we, you may speak. Hello. Oh, I think you're on mute, Merle. I think it's on mute. Hi. Hi. Sorry. Okay. Hi. Hello. I'm Merle from the Cape Town office in, in of NACCW. Um, you visited here once um, some years ago. And, yes. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, I just want to say thank you, as our, our chairperson said, for a simple and yet um, very deep and profound pr presentation. Um, and just to say that it, I have a comment rather than a question, and I'm sorry that there's some noise outside all of a sudden. We can't uh, hear it. Oh, okay, great. Um, but just that I, I think you made me, me think about the issue of belonging in relation to organizations and how it is that we hang together. Mm -hmm. I think that your, your mention of the, the great disappointment of the, the lack of growth in South Africa and what that has meant for all of us in the children's sector is that we are working harder and harder where we are, as it were. And even listening to Jabu earlier on, um, that we connect less with one another. Those mm -hmm. of us who are providing services, because we are struggling to, to manage and struggling to keep going, I think the same is true for children's homes and most people who are providing services for children is that what what we then in a sense cut down on is our connections beyond our own organizations mm -hmm. um, and i think that if i if i look back to south africa in the 90s and in the early 2000s we as a children's sector had a much stronger sense of belonging we were connected more with one another than we are now even in the days of of social media so um, I think it's really a significant issue that we, we need one another because we don't have a sense of power any longer. In a way, we're working with an implacable government, a government that is unaccountable. And so our sense of agency, I think, has diminished over the years. And, and it's something that we can only really find if we, if we work together. So mm -hmm. thank you very much for just making me think along, along those lines and prioritizing maybe in 2024 some more of the connection that we used to have as organizations. Thank, thanks very much to you. Thank you. Uh, Zeni, are there any more comments that we perhaps need to note? Yes, I think there's a, there's a, there's a, a a lovely one from Jabu again here, where she says that identity documents have been one of the issues that affect our children's sense of belonging. It's simple, as simple as that is something that we give, uh, we need to give attention to. 
We've got somebody who needs to mute. Thank you. Uh, and I think that that someone else says here, Charlie Williams, for me, belonging is about meaningful connections, especially for that one child Hello. and youth care Beverly. worker within child and youth care uh, centers that every child is asking for when the child care worker is on duty on leave that have been always an issue yeah. in our children's homes when when we've had shift system the child care workers leave and others come on children experience a sense of separation and and loss and and i think there's been many debates in the old days about how do we actually rec recognize uh, that chair there's been also uh, um here's another comment from margaret from kimberly saying that NACCW has done many programs to help children understand the self and significant others through this program children identify safe spaces it's such a magnificent experience to witness children finding healing in the programs offered changed behavior which was stirred by the lack of belonging and not trusting people to a strong sense of belonging where children regain their self-worth and their sense of being inspired to change and i think that that's wonderful coming from from kimberly yeah. as we can see with all with all the issues yeah. they they yeah. felt so chair those were a few of the comments yes thank you uh i don't see any other hands uh if there are any other people that would like to before we conclude our session Yes, Would just to like say to that the, the, there were questions yeah. from people, uh, Chair, about the book. They said, uh, Kim is referring to the book. Uh, uh, please tell us about your book and how we can oh. access it. Yes. Oh, just... well, thanks, guys. <laughs> My book is called uh, On Belonging, Finding Connection in an Age of Isolation. And I know you can get it online and I know that you can get it at, do you know of uh, exclusive books? Do exclusive books? The exclusive books is um, a bookstore chain here and I know that they have my book because they were kind enough to host me and uh, let me talk about it a bit. And I have a, I always get this wrong, but I believe it's Kim underscore belonging. Um, or just let me know if you'd like the book and I'll, uh, I can tell you where and how to get it. But uh, it's really, you, you know, the, writing the book was very isolating <laughs> for me, but I, it, it's kind of ironic, but also it was it really made it harder. But I, I got to, uh, I really got through doing that to be able now uh book was finished now i get to talk to people and it's it's a way someone may have something other than the four p's or a better way to do this or another way to describe it or a more culturally appropriate thing that's all fine for me it's about raising belonging up to the level of uh of how we can make positive change in the world but also what I think we all need to feel whole in our own lives. And uh, I believe I've accomplished what I wanted, which was to get a conversation started. And I'd really love to keep the conversation going with whoever is interested. Uh, yes, yes, thank you, Kim. So uh, exclusive books, you say, uh, will have it. And uh, I think yeah, it's Yeah, they mostly... have it online. Yeah, so they, yeah, <laughs> and they, they in the bookshop know. as well. Yeah. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for sharing with us that information. Uh, if there are no other questions or comments uh, from yes. my side, I, pardon, Jenny. Yes, I just wanted to say for my for myself, I was fielding other people's questions and comments, yeah. and to say that just for me, uh, Kim, thank you very much for 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 stirring, I think, the pot. I think everybody amongst us understands the, the issue or the word belonging, but you've actually helped define it, helped clarify it, help enrich our understanding of that. And uh, just to say thank you very much for making, uh, making wow. yourself available here for um, that. And for me, mm -hmm. I take back a lot that I think we can move forward in, particularly with the mapping and with my team of childcare workers here who can. Uh, explore this. I think we will 
we will set up a meeting to take a next step around that. Chair, thank you, Chair. Over to you. Thank you, Zeni. Uh, yes, Kim, uh, from my side, I would also say thank you because I think you have given us uh, what we call in Afrikaans, patkos, something to take along on the okay. road, especially when you mentioned how can we build belonging with our children, especially the vulnerable children, and uh, this is something that we could uh, build on. And I think most of our uh, participants this afternoon has put something into their bag. Uh, but we would like to call, we've got our deputy chairperson, Fiona, and we'd ask her then to do the vote of thanks on behalf of uh, all the participants here this afternoon. Fiona? Hello. <laughs> Good afternoon, Kim. Uh, thank you for us so much of food for thought for this afternoon. And I think some important points stand out very clearly from your message. Uh, I think we think concept of belonging and we understand generally we're going with all of it. But your breaking down of it has been so beautiful this afternoon. And I think we all take back, as you said, many things. Uh, I love the way you brought the whole thing together about moving from a space of isolation and loneliness to moving towards a space of common care, Ubuntu, and finding a space where um, there's holistic development that leads towards a sense of belonging. And I think also the broader concept that came out was that sometimes we might be thinking too small of a level. And when you think belonging, you're bringing it up in terms of a micro, macro, meso kind of level in all spaces of uh, you know, um, uh, functioning. But also the fact that you brought out so clearly that we have to recognize that no matter what our age is, belonging is a constant issue. Everyone is striving towards belonging and a sense of stability in their life. Uh, I think with your four beautiful Ps that you brought out, uh, yes, very clearly what stood out is the fact that what we offer to our children and youth in the field as NACCW and all the organizations who are members of NACCW, the work that we do is extremely significant in the fact that we bring all this together, maybe not so much putting the theory very clearly out there, but practicing it very clearly. Uh, in the sense that when you talk people and connections, everything we do in childcare is around relationships, connecting and building that relationships and building it to such an extent that it's strong and that it's growing constantly and that it is meaningful for that child, most importantly. So I think that was lovely that came out. And the fact that we must never forget all these intergenerational relationships that are there. Uh, you know, often in the field of residential, we forget or lose sight of the other relations that children have and that they may have had before even stepping through our doors. Um, so constantly reminding us that don't forget the other relations and moves on to the same thing of, of place, mapping, remembering the history, the background of a child, bringing it all together again as it all fits in so perfectly, helping the child feel grounded, stable in his space because he understands his background very clearly. Uh, the power you spoke about, I think, is in so many levels. Uh, the fact that we, the work we do is all about the independence of children, developing them uh, to a sense of autonomy, building up their leadership skills, and none of that can happen if they don't feel safe, if they don't have a sense of belonging. So that important point and, and, and place for the child and youth care sector in creating that grounded space for children to be able to be comfortable enough to have that wonderful strong voice out there comes out clear. And then with purpose, I think you so clearly spoke about purpose and you even said, I don't know what else to say about purpose. But I think for us, purpose is, um, you know, developing children to the sense of a higher purpose, understanding there's a deeper value in, in why they're here and where they're going to in life and their purpose uh, in the sense of what is my goals? What is my my own personal uh, principles, my values, these are things that come out in childcare when we're working with children all the time and it builds that whole sense of self, uh, self confidence, belonging and growth within. I think what you did when you rounded it all off and brought it to that circle was excellent um, because the circle brings out so many different analogies for us. It's a circle of courage and belonging is part of that, of course, but at the same time you talked about, um, you know, 
uh, expanding the circle, growing the circle, knowing that it's not just a tiny circle, it needs to evolve all the time. And I guess that's where the theory of change comes in so clearly is nothing is stagnant. It's always evolving and it's moving and shifting. Relationships shift, power shifts, dynamic shifts. So we're constantly growing with that child as we move through the process. And it's all about the developmental work that we're doing to help build that child and expand his circle more and more bigger as we go along. Uh, and also, just to end, uh, is acknowledgement of the fact that you have acknowledged all the child and youth care workers in this field uh, in, in the sense that they play such a significant role and they um, have a key role in meeting the sense of belonging, which can never be underestimated in the field that we're in. And paying tribute, especially to NACCW, because I think they are a, um, a grounding for us in the field, uh, for all child care workers in the sector. It also gives us a sense of belonging uh, in the field that we know we belong to a strong national body that has a good voice for children. And mm -hmm. it comes out clearly in these type of dynamics and connections that we have, again, related to all your different levels of connection that we have. And nothing works isolated. I think that's the point you've come across so clearly uh, with today is that everything is connected and we all are connected in some way or the other to making that difference in the child's life. So I think um, a special thank you to you for taking the time to do this with us. We've enjoyed it thoroughly. Lots of food for thought that we can take back to our programs and how we improve the way we we, we perceive uh, the sense of belonging for our children. I want to thank NACCW for facilitating and coordinating this process, everyone behind the scenes, to all our speakers um, uh, and facilitators who shared in this program, uh, to our guests who've joined us from synagogues and from right across the child protection sector, and as well as all our child and youth care workers in the field who are here and other colleagues in the field. We appreciate you being here and we hope you've enjoyed the session and that you take back a lot of lovely points that we can ponder over and use for in services as well with our staff. Thank you very much. Thank you. This uh, this was a joy for me. My my gratitude uh, is uh, is huge and I wish that we could go on for hours. Uh, because now I wouldn't be speaking. All of you would be sharing stories and and lessons with me. But I hope we'll get to do this again one day. And uh, and thank you all. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you once again, Kim. And let's give a, a big round of applause. Uh, there we go. We could see all the beautiful hearts and hands coming up. Ah, thank you. <laughs> Back to all of you. Back to all of you. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah, okay. thank you, and uh, we hope to in the new year that we will have another chance to have this conversation as we're going forward. And uh, we feel very, very proud as the NSW for the acknowledgement that you've given us. And uh, we feel we're now on the right track as we're going forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you for reinforcing and emphasizing that aspect of our work as well. Thank you. We hope you will, thank you. We hope you will have a, a good afternoon further and all the best going forward. The same to all of you. Thank you. Be well. Thank you. And bye -bye. on that note, on thank that you. note, we will say goodbye to everybody. Enjoy your afternoon further. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you, Kim.